It's all over. The time has come. He's reached his end. Okay, that's when the neshama, that's when the neshama goes out. What is there a spook then? What? There's a spook up there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a spook up there. Why Dafka 30 days? So one of the pshatim that I saw in a sefer, the name of the sefer is, uh, I don't remember the second, but one of the, one of the pshatim that I saw is because we know in Choshen Mishpat that if a person is renting a then uh, you have to give the guy 30-day warning before you throw him out. If you don't have a contract, you still have to give him 30-day warning before you throw him out. So too, a Kaddish Baruch Hu gives you a 30-day warning before he throws you out of your neshama, your neshama out of your goof. Before he gets rid of you, he says that I'm giving you uh, another 30 days. Okay, that's, that's one. B, another idea which is brought down is that, um, is that uh, if the tzaddikim did everything, the tzaddikim did everything because Hashem said, so Hashem will not do something without the, without the consent of the tzaddik. So therefore the tzaddikim, a lot of times they know 30 days before, they know 30 days before exactly what's going to happen. And I mentioned that we've had many cases of dayanim, of people that say that people decided to go and throw and write a will. They used to write, they wanted to write some type of will. 30 days before, and they ended up being niftar, dying soon after that. Now, as Sir Morris even told us a story about his, his mother, that 30 days before she started realizing that something is not, uh, is not going into it. And Yoni also gave me a story about someone who was in a pigua, that 30 days before, what was the person doing? The person was that? He, was doing, he wrote a tzavah right before, and 30 days before, a person was in a, in a pigua. How do you say a pigua? Yeah, she was calling out her name. A what? A terrorist attack. You know, a person was in a terrorist attack, and 30 days before, he already started writing a tzava, a will, and he already started writing certain things to be able to do it, which is a bigger chiddush, but it's also true, it's also written in the farm, that even if he's not, let's say, sick or old, or any of those types of symptoms, he was a normal person, but the neshama already knows this guy is having his day soon, even though it was an accident that occurred, even though it happened through some type of accident, but obviously... There's no accidents in this world. Everything happens on purpose. So I'm just saying that this is a very factual thing. It's based on the Zohar, and it's uh, for sure a true thing that occurs. Okay? Um, basically, the way the Zohar says it works is he says, for those whole 30 days, your neshama slowly but surely goes up 1 30th every day. And, he, and it's brought down that that is the best time to start doing tshuva. During that time period, it's the best time to do tshuva. Now you're going to ask me, excuse me, how am I supposed to know when this time is? Obviously, if I know, it's good. Or Hashem, Alvai, it should be that way. Like, um, there was a person who the doctor told him that you don't have much time left. He was given two months and he was very depressed. So he had Shlomo Zaman Orbach went to visit him. Shlomo Zaman went to visit him and he told him, you know, you're a lucky guy. Baruch Hashem, Hashem told you, He told you your 30 days. He gave you the 30 days ahead of time. He said, the Zohar says it's going to be 30 days. And Hashem gave you some warning. Now you can pay back all your debts. Now you can ask your mechila from all the people that you insulted, especially your wife. You can start closing all, all doors. Some people, unfortunately, lo aleinu, they get in a big car accident, something happens, finish, and Shalom Yisrael. They, they're left with a lot of open, open things, which we'll be speaking about later, about Gilgulim, that have to come back because they didn't clo- make closure. So you have to sometimes... It's something to appreciate when we know. So you're asking me, how do I know about when these 30 days is going to happen? How do I know when these 30 days is going to happen? So the answer is that you don't, except for individuals. For special tzaddikim, they know when these 30 days are going to happen. As we find in a number of, as we find in a number of, uh, of places, the, in the Midrash, it's a, uh, you mind just telling me to be able to quiet? I feel bad to make people think. But... I don't like usually telling people, but it's, uh, I'm, I'm just, what I'm happened to the contract? Like, it's just such an ego. The, the landlord and the renter. I'm sorry. What? The landlord, if you give a contract. Like, so Hashem gives you a 30 day warning a little bit, a little bit. So you know, we, we need to know, you're saying. I need notice. You can't read the notice, you can't know. Uh-huh. So the answer is for tzaddikim, they do know. And if you're not a tzaddik, then I guess it's your fault. <laughs> I guess that's what it is. <laughs> I understand. But if a person's at a certain enough level, then they usually know. Like I said, <coughs> we have people on certain levels. Here, here, let me give you a few examples of tzaddikim that happened. First of all, with Aaron, we all know that uh, when he gave to Elazar, Benet, his son, he wanted to give over the reins to his son, Elazar. So he did it a number of days before, because he knew it was time to die. Also, Moshe Rabbein was obvious, I don't know what to tell you about. Right? But in order to be able to give it over, he, uh, he did it. That's first of all. The Or Chaim HaKadosh and Parshat Vayelech. Parshat Vayelech at the end of the Torah, very beautiful Or Chaim HaKadosh, could I to see it? Over there he brings on the idea 
of Vayikrivu Yemei Yaakov Lamutz. Right? We find many times Vayikrivu Yamim. It says Vayikrivu Yemei Yaakov Lamut. Or it said Vayelech Moshe. The Moshe was on his way out. So the Ramban says, I'll peep shot. What's the simple understanding? He was getting old. The man was getting old. Yaakov Avinu, okay, you know, 147 is pretty, he's up there. It's time to go. Okay, 120 years old. It's time, it's time to go. So Moshe Rabbeinu knew he was getting... And therefore, the Ramban says that therefore he knew that, his, that this was the last day of his life. Now, the with Moshe Rabbeinu, he was in perfect condition on the last day of his life. He just died automatically. He was niftar automatically. But the Arachayim says, Al Piya Zohar, and the Arachayim many times speak, Al Piya Kabbalah. He says, it has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with that. He said, it's totally different. Hakara zu mushbachi le gdole olam. For the gdole olam, they have a certain hakara. And he says, because the tzaddikim know, and he says 40 days, by the way. He says 40 days. Yes, it was 30. He says 40 days. Okay. It's a little bit of a contradiction if it's 40 or 30 days. He says, and then they know a little bit beforehand what is going to happen. And the Kodesh Baruch Hu gives them some notice beforehand in order that they can get ready and give over their Yerusha. And he says, that's Pshat, in, uh, this is Lashen, Hargashat Nishmeto, his Neshama starts feeling that it's going away, Lifnei Azman, it's already on its way out. In other words, they have an internal type of feeling that the time has come, and therefore they're ready to give what they need to. And that's why we know Yaakov gave the brachot, Yab Moshe Rabbeinu gave the brachot, everybody did what they needed to do, they made their closure in order to do that, and people who are on a high level, level are able to do it. Like I said, a good number of examples, which we said, of people who know when a person's on a high enough level, then Kiilu, you really know what's... Uh, uh, what's happening? Okay, that's what it is. Now, there's one nakuda which I didn't. I wanted to mention, which I didn't speak about last time, is this idea called tzelem. Tzelem is something that might come up a decent amount. Okay, and uh, when they talk about this idea of yikrevu yemei, it means that he starts feeling his tzelem parting from him. Okay, now the tzelem literally means an image. We know tzelem elokim is an image. But what it is, is a certain type of image that you have of yourself. There is a mirror image of you, Kebe Yochel, in Shemaim that is within you. That, that's what goes up into, into Shemaim. Just to make a little bit of clarity, I'm sure some of us know, some of us don't. Let me just get it straight. We have five neshamot, mi karon. Okay, which is not including the tzelem. We have five neshamot. We have the highest one, is called the chaya. Okay, the, the chaya nechida. Okay, those are not contained within any type of things. They are surrounding, they're above us, they're not in our body. They're around us, they surround us. Those are the two highs in the Shema. You don't hear so much about them because we don't understand them and they're not within us, so we don't know. Then you have the three, which are a little bit more popular than Iran. You have, after the Chayyichida, you have the Neshama. The Neshama is placed over here in our Zeichel. Now we only have a piece of the Neshama. Everyone thinks our whole body is a Neshama. No, we have the bottom of the Neshama, which is almost like a cable, Connecting us to Shemayim. It's almost like a wire that connects us to Shemayim. That is Kol Man Denafich Midilei Nafich. That's when the Gurdjie Baruch who gave us Kebi Yochel a piece of him. Kol Man Denafich Midilei Nafich. Hashem gave us Kebi Kiilu a piece of him. That is the Neshama. I don't want to call it the spirit, the soul, whatever you want to call it. That is with that is contained uh, within us. That is our strange, unexplained phenomenon that we have called conscience. This idea that we have a certain type of conscience that we have ourselves, or if you want a self-conscious, there's two things. One, we'll talk about the conscious later, not now. Okay, something we uh, think, but the self-conscious, which if you live in a world of of big bangs, if you world in a world of things that just create themselves, it makes absolutely no sense that we should have some type of self-conscious about ourselves. Why do we feel guilty when we do something wrong? Even if you don't have a Torah, even people who have, there's always some type of conscience within it, there's some type of uh, matzpun, that's a great word in Hebrew, matzpun, it's like a, a feeling of, of, that's always within us, that's, that's caring within us, that giving us a heavy do you think it bothered Hitler so much that he decided to make a holocaust because of it, right? Because he said, we're the ones who brought this conscience into the world. And that means he himself had it. Why does he care that we brought a conscience into the world? Obviously he himself had some type of conscience himself. And therefore he was trying to get rid of it. The Satan himself, right? He was the Samech Mem himself, the, the Satan himself, was interested in trying to get rid of us for one and only reason. Because, as he writes in his Mein Kampf, that we created this idea called... The conscious, the self, the self-conscious that we have about why do you feel bad about when you do something, being musar, musari, and being a certain amount of uh, being appropriate and not doing things which are incorrect and certain things. And if a person is retarded, what's wrong with killing the person? The person is defective, so you should get rid of him. Why should he destroy the world? And obviously the Aryan race. I'm not going to get into that now. But upon him, this idea 
everybody has it, like I said, and this is the biggest proof, even the Russia himself, even Yimach Shema, the Russia himself had it, because that's why he was so busy chasing after us with a pistol in order to be able to get rid of us. Okay, but al where where's that come from? That's the Neshama. That's the Nakud of this Neshama, which is connected to us, which we have it to a certain extent. Now, Goyim have it less than Jews. The Jews are on a, kind of a different level, but let's leave that. Anyway, so that's... Um, that's that. That's also a reason why we say Gama Nefesh Lo Sometimes a person tries to satiate himself with every tithe in the world that he can get his hands on, right? A person, uh, the, the idea that we were raised with is to influx ourselves, not all of us, but I think most of us, to influx ourselves. If you really want to enjoy life, try to get as much of the thing that you want as possible. If it's money, if it's kavod honor, and if it's women, if I could say, or some type of illicit things, just get a lot of it. That's why internet is such a fantastic thing. I can get anything I want, anytime I want. Fantastic. That's fantastic? No. That's what we call an addiction. Right? That's called a problematic situation. That's not good. That's a dis- and the, the The facts state themselves. But Al-Qupanim, that's the neshama that tells us that you will never be fully satiated until you fill yourself with something spiritual. Something you have to have a little bit more. Something with what we call a tachlit, a purpose in life. I need to have something. So that's the neshama. The, the fourth level, we said, chay uh, neshama, okay, is over here. Now, ruach is over here. The ruach is the connector between the body and the soul. The ruach is literally called uh, wind, okay? But the ruach is the point of connection between the body and the soul. I, I like to think of it as the neck. It really goes lower than the neck. And then as far as it goes, it goes to bone, here. Yeah, but it's similar to, the, it's similar to that idea, that bone, but just like the neck connects between the head and the body, the torso, so to the ruach is the point of connection. Let me say that in, in, in actuality, it's really connecting the lev, the heart, but the heart and the lev is not so, it's not so far away from each other. And it's connected that, uh, that idea of, of, um, of that. The neshama you get uh, appropriately when you're 20 years old, okay? When you're 20 years old, the higher level of the neshama when you're 20. That's why you're only obligated in, in beitin shel shamayim, in the beitin upstairs, you're only chayv when you're 20 years old, okay? Some people make a fast when they turn 20. Some people try to fast when they turn 20, because it's too late for everybody in this room, right? But the reason why you do it is, is uh, because you suddenly become chayav in the beitin shel shamayim. Now... Really, really, you're responsible for all your actions in the upper world. If you do something that's chayv bidei shamayim, many things that you can do wrong are chayv in mita bidei shamayim. And in the upstairs uh, beitin, right? You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, the beitin uh, in, in the beitin upstairs, right? The higher courts upstairs. Okay, when, the ruach, which is this last part I just mentioned, that's when you turn 13 bar mitzvah. When you turn bar mitzvah. When you turn bar mitzvah, so then you get the ruach, which is the point of when you are obligated in this world. In other words, if you do something wrong, you're held responsible in a court of law, not like the goyish laws, right? In the civil courts, they wait till I don't know, till you're 67. What? How old? 18. Are you really high? You're responsible when you're 18. I don't know. <laughs> Everything seems to they seem to get away with it. Okay, 18. But over here, it's 13. Okay, and now things we hold that you're responsible when you're 13. And that is the fourth level. The last level is called the nefesh. The nefesh is known as the dam, the blood, or the, or the kaved. The kaved is the liver, which is, of course, the container of the dam, which takes care of your dam. And that is, everybody has that, even animals. The nefesh is what gives you life. What's the difference between this table and the animal and the cats outside, or me? Right? It's different levels. Our nefesh and their nefesh is not the same. But the nefesh is what gives us a breath of life, what we call life. Well, okay? Lowest, and it's the lowest portion. And that's what gives us all our drives, our tavot, what we're so interested in being as animalistic as possible. If you want to know what a nefesh looks like when you chase all your animalistic desires, you can take a flight across the ocean. You'll see a lot of people like that. Okay? That's basically uh, the thing. I could really take a, a trip not too far either. But Al-Kupanim, that's it. That's it. Okay, now this is usually what's known as or Melech or Kalem. Melech is Moach, Lev, Kaved. Moach, Lev, Kaved. Moach is the Neshama. The Lev is the Ruach. And the Kaved is the Nefesh. Okay? Those are the three aspects. A person who his brain is in charge of his body, he knows how to be Sholet on himself. He's in charge of himself. Not every whim that he has to have, he can control himself. He's a Melech. He's a king. Because his Moach comes before that. But the other way around, if it's the other way around, if his body is in charge of his Moach, meaning his drives are the one that makes the decisions, so that we say Kalem, backwards. Kalem literally means destruction. Why did I stop making up a word Kalem? I didn't stop making it up. Tozer brings that Bil'am, Bil'am Rasha, the Navi, the famous Navi, Bil'am Rasha, 
when he knew a split second when Hashem would uh, be angry, could be angry, split second every day. And Tosa said, what can he say in a split second? What kind of curse could you say in a quarter of a second that can, that can do it? He knew exactly a quarter of a second that Hashem gets angry, and he could figure out that second. He said, what can he say? Tosa says, kalim. That's the words he can say, destruction. Okay, he can say those words, kalim. That's what he could say. But it's the same idea. The covet, lev, covet, when a person's body is in charge over his mind, so that is kalem, that's absolute destruction. That's a person who, like I said, doesn't look, uh, doesn't look so pretty. These are our five facets. This is an absolute requirement, these things to remember and know. First of all, in all of Judaism, I think it's important to know it. But for all our discussions that we're going to have in the future also, because we're going to always be discussing the neshama parting from the goof and how much, and how much, when you go to sleep, why isn't everyone dead when they go to sleep? Why are you still breathing? You're dead? We say you're one sixtieth dead. What does that mean? Because that's the neshama is what leaves. You still have your ruach and you still have your nefesh. The ruach and nefesh is still there. Only the neshama goes up there. He makes a uh, calculation. A cheshbon in shamayim. Cheshbon uh, in shamayim. Good word? Account? Accountants. Accountant upstairs. He takes an accountant up there. Right? Because Baruch was there and he watches your neshama and he checks you out. Mm-hmm. You understand? But your ruach, your wind... I hate these English words, but I have no other way of saying it. Your spirit, but that's also spirit. The neshama is also spirit. Now, what's the difference between the neshama, ruach, and nefesh? Can you give me three different words? Soul. The soul is the higher one? They all, they all sound to me. Maybe the soul? No, English, the English don't have it. Because the English don't have it, right. If anything, they have it. I see. <laughs> they have the bottom, right. Soul sounds like soul music to me, right? <laughs> sound very good. But anyways, that's a nefesh, ruach, and neshama. The neshama goes up when you sleep, but the other parts stay connected. They stay down in, uh, in things. Agopani, that's what it is. Now, on, after this introduction, okay, like I said, now we can understand this idea that we call the tselem. The tselem, and this is an important concept, we have every single person in this world and that has ever existed, has a mirror image of himself up in Shemaim that comes down. And when a person dies, it goes up. But it's there and it's always there. That's Ki'ilu, your part in Olam Abba. Your Tzalem is like when you look in a mirror, you see an image of yourself, but we all know it's a fake. If you break the glass, it doesn't look. Mm-hmm. So also this, this is like something, it's, it's a two-dimensional image of who you are. But it's like, you know, like a picture like a hologram, because it's like a hologram, which looks like something, it looks like you, but it's not really you. You're right. No, when you say it looks like you, you look yeah. like our It has image. your image, yes, it has your image. They can recognize Benji Rieti when they see this telling, they'll see who it is, you I can see. Not, yeah, yeah, I don't know if they'll have the glasses and the beard or anything, I'm not sure exactly details, how much detail is, I've never seen it yet. Yeah. But Bikaran, it has that tzura, the, the same formations or the same things that you have, and that is a real thing that exists. And we find this in many places. Now this Tzalem seems to be similar to the Ruach, because your Neshama goes up and that's it, but your Ruach is always with you. But when a person dies, the Tzalem goes up into, goes up into in Shemaim. The Or Chaim HaKadosh. Or Chaim is a Pirush on Chumash. They call him Or Chaim HaKadosh, because he has a lot of Kabbalah in there, but he's a Pirush that everybody learns. The Hasidim love it, they learn it very much, because he takes Kabbalah and makes it very practical. Okay, he makes it very practical. He talks about the tselim a lot. So if you would see it, you'd, you'd probably think, okay, tselim al I don't know exactly what he means. But this is what he means. He means this mirror image that you have up in Shemaim, which is uh, up there. And he, what, the reason why he puts it in our context is he says, when it says, he, he feels the tselim slowly parting. He feels the right hand's going, the left hand, and then slowly this. Each part of it, every vessel, every aver, every part of his body is slowly but surely uh, disappearing. It's going away from him. It could take 30 days, according to this Lashit of the Zohar, this Tzalem, until it eventually is able to completely uh, disconnect. And that's when a person, as they say, drops dead. Say again? This is separate. Yeah. This is an addition to these five things. To the five things? So I, I don't 100% know, but to me, the way it sounds all the time is it's similar to the Ruach. It is very, that's why I mentioned it. The neshama goes up and down and you still survive even without a neshama to a certain extent when you're sleeping. The ruach is really what keeps you ticking. Okay? And the nefesh also. But the ruach is what keeps you... And when that goes up, so then eventually a person can't, uh, can't be sustained anymore. Okay? I want to mention one thing. The, the nefesh also, you should know, we're going to speak about it now, I'm not speaking about this now, but even after a person's dead, there's a small part of the nefesh that remains with the body. That's why a person can feel pain in the kever. There's a certain amount of a nefesh that still remains in the body. But be karan, the ruach disappears and then a person is dead. We'll speak about how much, I don't know exactly how much, but we'll speak about how that works when we speak about chibuta kever. We talk about the pain that a person goes through in the kever. 
So then we'll speak about what it has to do with your nefesh, that final last point still stays. A great example of nefesh, by the way, I didn't mention it. I think this could, I don't know, I always think about it. Every time I think about it, when it comes up, it shouldn't happen to you, but it's painful. I don't know if you ever, you ever sleep. Uh, now, obviously, you've had things fall asleep, like your leg or this. But if you ever had, like one time you slept on your hand or something like that, slept on your hand to such a strong extent that no, it, it goes it so goes numb, it goes limb. And sometimes it can get to such an extent that it's usually over a long night's sleep. It goes limb and this, whatever. But you don't even know, you can't even feel your hand to a certain extent. You ever, you ever try picking it up? Do you know what I'm talking about? Or no, it happens to many people. Okay, it's happened to me. Ruch Hashem hasn't to me in a while. What? Yeah, you have to rub it to go and then you see pins and needles. The pins and needles is yeah. the blood going back into your capillaries. Yeah. Now, that pack of, and, but until the blood starts coming back into your arteries, okay, and then the capillaries, which you feel the little things, right, until it starts going in, it might, you can't even, I, I, do you know, I can't even pick up my hand. You, if you go like this, you could do it, it hurts, but you could pick up your hand and go like this, but it hurts. Yeah. What does that mean? And it's also heavy. It's also heavy, like a dead body. Because that is the nefesh. A nefesh, a dam, one nefesh. The Pasuk says, the blood is nefesh. Suddenly, it's an incredible feeling. You should think about it next time it happens. I'm serious. You have a dead piece of meat here, and then suddenly, that, wow, this is incredible. Now you don't appreciate it. You guys are spoiled brats. You get 24 hours a day full service here. Because Baruch gives you blood, this, I can move, I can get up and, you know what I mean? Hashem gives us full, full, uh, full, uh, full service. Okay, but when it happens, and it's dead, and you don't feel it, and then it, shh, comes in, then after it hurts a little bit, and then you pick it up, and it feels lighter, it feels much lighter. That is a dabu nefesh, this feeling of, of thing. That's why if you carry a dead body, a dead body on Shabbat, you're chayv, but if you carry a lot, it's heavier. And you're chayv on Shabbat. And if you carry a live person on Shabbat, like a baby or a child, you're not chayv on Shabbat. You're not chayv. It's, it's their abundant, because chayno set asma. A person carries himself. Ki'ilu, he carries him, and you carry You're both carrying him. What does that mean? A set asma. A person carries himself? Yes. Because we all know we're much lighter when we're alive than chas shalom when the other guy's dead. Okay? Even when a person faints, they get heavier. Heavier, right. Yeah. To a certain extent, yeah. Even though over there he has his nefesh, but yeah, you're right. Okay, al him that's, uh, that's this idea of the tzalem. Let me give you just a few examples of where this tzalem takes place in many ideas and concepts which you're familiar with. And the tzalem, where is this tzalem that comes up sometimes? The Gemara brings down in Ketuvot that Rebbe, even after he died, used to come and make kiddush for his family. Okay, there's a big question. How can you make kiddush after you're dead? You're part of from mitzvot. You're not allowed to make kiddush for them. Okay, his family didn't ask questions, I guess, but they were yotz and kiddush with him. They were quite happy, and they were quite happy. The Rebbe was still coming, and they were still okay. Rabbeinu and kiddush for a while until someone noticed, and then he stopped coming. Okay, and then he stopped coming because he didn't want people to start talking. Hey, Rabbeinu was still alive. Okay, but anyways, can you, can you who was coming? Can you be That's what I'm saying. That's a big lot. The, the place can speak about it. They get very, you know, the lip fix. You know, it's a lip fix. It's this beautiful idea. Wow, Rabbeinu and Kaddish comes down, and they and they go, "How can you be with the kid?" You know, like it's a lambdish uh, thing. They'll talk about because uh, we say I made this putter from the mitzvahs. But how is he able to come down? Who is this? That's his tzelim. His tzelim was still coming down and displaying the image of Rabbi. That's how they knew it was Rabbi. And he was coming down in this ghostly type of tzelim that was able to be Motsi, everybody else. Har Sinai. We all say everybody was on Har Sinai. What do you mean we're all on Har Sinai? I don't remember being there. The answer is Yurt Selim. Yes, Yurt Selim and Yurt Selim and Yurt Selim was all on Har Sinai. We all stood by Har Sinai and it stayed up in cloud nine over there for a little while until it was placed in your body. And it was placed until your individual body. Our Parsha, our Parsha and Parsha Vayera, we know that the Malachim came to, um, to Avram Avinu dressed in like people, they will look like people, and that comes from a certain tzelem that they push. They dress themselves, and they look like Arabs, but in a demut of a person, which is based on this tzelem. This is all based on the different farm that they bring it in different places. This idea, what? I, that's I'm not sure. I know that's what it sounds like. There's a Ramban that speaks out this idea. He, he also brings al pisod. It seems to be something like that. I don't know 100. percent I can't answer that. I'm not going to answer some things which I don't know. Okay, we have a Rabbeinu Bechaye that says when Yaakov Avinu Lomet, we all know Yaakov Avinu didn't die, and he says what that means is that his Selim still stayed connected. He still had his Selim that was still there, and that's why he's still considered uh, around. Also, we'll be speaking in the future about Ruchot, about different spirits that are, that are traveling around in this world, spiritual world. Listen, here. <laughs> Yeah, there are certain spirits that are, that are traveling around in this world. Can hear. Yeah, you can hear. That's what I meant. That's what I'm saying. You hear, the, you hear the spirits? They say animals can see the dogs especially. Yeah, they say that. Yeah, It could be. They say barking. Yeah, it could be. Or it could be they're hearing a high-pitched sound also. But yeah, it could be. They do say that. We're going to speak about these things. We'll have, we'll have a couple of shirim on the spirits also. We'll try to bring them down to help us out. 
But uh, on the spirits, it also is based a little bit on these tselems that are still uh, uh, things. Many times we're about to have in a shir or two, I think already next year, I'm not sure, that next year or then, we're going to speak about near-death experiences. Many times in these near-death experiments, not many times, 99.9% of the times, they always see their body immediately after death. The guy gets in a car accident, boom, and suddenly he's looking down in his body. Suddenly he's looking down in his body. Three seconds later, he's looking down in his body. It's an unbelievable thing. What does it mean you're looking down? So most people say you're in a shaman. It's really your tselem. The tselem of the person is able to see himself, and they have eight, things you can't deny. There's not, it's no games anymore. I mean, over a million, they have over a million different cases of near-death uh, people that were able to be pulled out. Rosh Hashanah technology, we're able to save a lot of people. And with that, we're also able to prove that God exists. Okay? That's, um, that's that. And the last one, which is what I want to move on to the next subject is this, okay? The last place where we see a display of the tzelem is the following subject. Until now we spoke about 30 days before death. Now we're going to speak about the next stage, which is samuch lamita, close to death. The time period before a person, a person dies. Close to mita, the Zohar says like this in Parshat Vayichi. He says that you're able to see things that most people are not able to see. She'ein reshut l'rotam be'et acher. And one of those, the first one are, guess what? Your friends and your relatives and your close relatives, which what? Which are not here anymore, those that already passed away. They're going to be there to greet you, to welcome you to Me'am in Fur The Zohar says that they're going to be there to, to welcome you in and to tell you, Shalom Aleichem, Baruch Haba. Okay, welcome to, uh, to, to, to uh, paradise. Paradise, right? Paradise, yeah? Welcome to paradise. Welcome, to paradise. welcome, welcome home. <laughs> Okay, they're the ones who come to tell you to tell you how you're doing. Okay, and so the question is, how do you see these people? These people are there in Shemaim. You're seeing their tzelem. You're seeing their image, which is up in Shemaim, and that's why you're able to recognize them. That's why the person again. Whenever I say you, I mean in the plural you. I don't mean an individual you. Okay, I make that statement before. Okay, I mean in general you. Okay, that when a person sees the uh, his, these parents of his or his relatives etc things like that he's able to recognize them because you see them in the image of this mirror image which exists up in Shemaim this little hologram or whatever it is and that's the another display of the tzelem that you're able to see now he says uh, the Zohar writes before they, they, they look the way they looked when they were in Oil Mazeh the way they were looked in this world that's what you're about to ask he says that you're able to see them the way they as what stage. I thought about that. I don't know. You're saying when they were 90 or when they were 60, right? I don't know. The moment they died. I don't know. I would guess the moment they died, I would say, but who knows? I, I can't. I can't tell you. He doesn't say. Okay? And I didn't see any before. So I also looked around for that. I didn't know exactly, but it looks like the guy. I don't know. You're right, though. Recognize okay, you recognize him. You definitely recognize him. It's just a question. He wants to know how old he is. You know, was he when he was 80 or when he was 50 or when he was, you know, in his good looking 20s, right? Who knows? Yeah. But, anyways, that's a. Uh, um, okay. What, oh, okay. So that I'm going to get to soon. Okay. Uh, if you're asking already, he asks, what do you see with? How do you see these people? You see with your eyes? The answer is, when you read inside of the Svarim Kedoshim, especially in the Zohar, the way it says, it's not, it says, lo re'iya keriya mamish. It's not a re'iya like we're used to seeing. It's a type of seeing which is ki'ilu, I'm not even sure of in technology we have such a thing like that, but you have a type of seeing a vision that you're able to see things that is straight from your brain that you're able to compute it. Like, what's the point of your eyes? Because you have your pupil that takes in the image, okay, turns it upside down, it gets on your retina, okay, it gets on your optic nerve, sorry, and from there it computes it to your brain, and your brain is able to see the image, and then it computes the image. So you just skip all those steps, basically. Just skip all the steps. It goes straight to your brain, and you're able to see it in an automatic way. Now, that's all a nice way of explaining it, but I'm telling you right now, none of us can understand it, it's just something you have to experience. Okay, it's an idea, what they say, you can't understand, it's just a koach of re'iyah, which is a re'iyah ruchani, which you experience it. An extra sense. An extra sense, something like that, yeah. I mean, the closest thing we have these days, those stupid little things that they have, you can watch uh, movies with these things or something like that, what are they called? Uh, virtual reality. Virtual realities, virtual realities, because they're trying to get as close to Allah Mabba as possible, you understand? They're already halfway there, so they're... So they're trying to make it, but it's this idea that skip all the steps, don't look at all the it's like already like in your brain, like it's already sucked in there. And it's very funny, because like I said, everything I'm about to say now, these, all these few things I'm speaking about, what happens close to death, everything word for word I quote from a Chazal, I'm telling you, it's all Midrashim, Gemarot, and Zohar, period. I'm quoting everything from there, 
And then when you will hear, the, you have to remember them, because when you hear the near-death experiences, word for word, it's not even a joke. It's like every single detail is in there. And I, look, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, I never had one of these things. I'm not coming to sell anything. I don't have to try to make it up. I'm telling you from what I see in, in books. I'm, I'm saying, I'm seeing the text. I saw all the text, I went through it and this, and then afterwards you hear the news, and it's a joke, it's like ridiculous, it's almost exactly the same things. And all of them, many of them, and nothing's all, but many of them say the same idea, and then suddenly you see this light, but you don't see the light, it's something, I just can't explain it. It's something that can't be explained, it's a, it's a, hard, it's a feeling like this, that you experience the light, and, you're doing, and they're just trying to word it in some type of way to make you understand what this thing is. You understand? Because nobody really can explain it properly because of the reason I just said. The Zohar says it's, you see it, but you don't see it. It's like, re'iyah ve'in or re'iyah. You understand? It's an experience that you have. And the best way I can understand is it, it skips the stage of your life. It just goes straight to your brain and suddenly you're, you're there. You're there. You understand what it is? So that's, um, that's what it is. Okay, so what happens is seeing, you see these relatives... They're all happy to see you in general. Most of them are happy to see you as long as you were somewhat of a good boy here. If you weren't a Russia Gamur, then they're happy to see you and they tell you and you know, they give you an introduction here to guess, guess where you are, okay? If a person's an Adzakai, so they'll start being upset and well, they'll start telling you and they'll start telling you about what Kehanim's about or whatever. They start introducing you to your new, uh, your new, half, uh, your new uh, habitat, okay? That's, uh, that's uh, I'm just quoting it, like I said, the Idrazuta, Idrazuta says that uh, brings from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Idrazuta was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself, actually. But it says that that uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, when he uh, reached his last day on Lag Omer, when he was Niftar, over there seventy tzaddikim came to him. Seventy neshamot of tzaddikim came to him, and they were all bokim or ve'atarot. They all had crowns, and they were. Uh, beacons of lights that were coming to bring him upstairs. And the Gemara and Brachot and Afchavchet, Rabbi Yochanan and Zakai, when he was surrounded by his Talmidav, he was he started you know, what we would say hallucinating. That's what most people think. He's hallucinating. But he starts saying, oh, here he is, here he is. He's doing the Gemara. There's Yechezkel, the king Yechezkel. He was an ancestor of the king of Yechezkel. Yechezkel, uh, uh, of Chizkiyahu, not Yechezkel. Yechezkel was Navi. Of Chizkiyahu, the king Chizkiyahu is coming to take me upstairs. He's coming to take me upstairs. He's coming to take me upstairs. The, the Zohar also writes, a Yisod, that the person who comes to take you is someone who's on the similar level to you are, meaning he's going to be, he's going to introduce you to where you're going to be because we're on the same uh, wavelength over here in Ganeda. As we all know, as we'll speak about, there are different levels in Ganeda. Okay? Upstairs in Ganeda, there are different levels. So whoever's on your cloud, okay, whoever's wherever you are, that's the one who's going to be uh, taking you to, uh, to there. The Yushalmi brings, the Rebbe Liezer, when he was Nifter, he says, Rebbe, Rebbe Yochanan ben Zakkai. Okay, and in the Hagdama to Geshar Chaim, Geshar Chaim is a sefer on Avelut. He writes a number of these Mar Mekomot that you say. And over there they have a Ha'ara on the bottom, a Ha'ara on the bottom of that sefer of Geshar Chaim, who, like I said, is a sefer who writes about these, uh, some of these concepts. It's with Tukachinsky, who was Nifter about 60, 70 years ago. And it's from his children. His children said, when our father was Nifter, and he was close to his last, his last minutes or whatever it is, he looked up and he said, Oh, my Rebbe, Rav Shmuel Salanter is coming to greet me. He started saying hello to Rebbe Shmuel Salanter. Oh, wow, Rav Shmuel. He, he wanted to get up even for him. It says he gave like this covet. Rav Shmuel Salanter was the Rebbe of Yushalayim. He was the Rebbe of Yushalayim before. And he said he was a Rebbe. And they said he himself, who wrote a little bit about this, he himself was being Mikabal Pnei Raboy, as they say. He was already being uh, uh, Mikabal. Okay, so this is one idea, which like I said... You will see it all the time in the near-death experiences. They always say the relatives were this relative, that relative. They always say that. Even by the Goyim, many times they have these, uh, these ideas, but it's all written about 2,000 years before. Hala, let's continue. Another thing that occurs... Say again? The Goyim don't have the Neshama, then how are they having... Uh, they have a certain type of neshama, but it's a different level. It's a different level of neshama. But they definitely have these types of experiences. You can't deny that they're going to go to... We, we are a religion that believes, and we're the only religion that believes... The Goyim also have a chilek in Olam Abba, even if you're not Jewish. Now the truth is, they're not going to have the same chilek as a Jew. We all know that it's a different type of level. Sukhbet. One is Sukhbet, one is Ikar, one is Tafel. One is subservient, if I could say, to the other type of, um, to the other type of uh, that we will have. But at least we believe that. The Christians, we're all damned going to Satan, right? And uh, the, the Muslims, I don't have to tell you, right? They're, they're still busy trying to put us there. They're going right? to be, they're going to be, be smaller than 
Everything's yeah, falling yeah. out. Yeah, we're, everything. Everybody's against us, but uh, we're the only ones that believe this way. Okay. <laughs> so I said because they have some type of neshama, it's just not the same type of thing. Hala. Okay. Another thing that a person sees before he is niftar, before he passes away, is an interesting one, and this is not a good idea if you can ever try. Uh, what's uh, brought down, and as I'll bring you a few proofs to this, is if you were, if a person ever tried to answer up a Talmid Chacham, if you ever tried to answer a Sefer, or you tried to answer someone else's Torah, to answer the Torah of another person, and try to explain him from all the questions. So it says over there that that Talmid Chacham himself will come to escort you into Shemayim. He will have an appreciation for you to such an extent that he's willing to come and bring you up. The Gemara in Baba Kama and Kuf Yud Aleph of Baba Metziah Saf Memarebet says, Rava said that Rav Oshia will come to take me up. He came and took me, he will take me up to Shemayim because my whole life I tried to answer him. Not just one time you answered him. A person who works and goes out of his way to try to answer the Torah of someone else, he will be like that. There's an interesting sefer, of, I don't know if you know, it's called the Magid Mesharim. I don't know if everyone's heard of it. The Magid Mesharim is a sefer of Rav Yosef Cairo. Rav Yosef Cairo is Maran, Shulchan Aruch. He has a sefer, Magid Misharim, which is a very a one of its kind type of sefer. Now, the Magid Misharim, the, the, it was known the Beit Yosef had a Magid that used to sit next to him. Okay, he had a Magid that used to come to visit. What do I mean a Magid? I don't mean uh, the Magid speaks. I don't mean Pesach Kron or Shalom Shadron either. What do I mean? I mean a Malach used to come and help him sometimes. Now, when you look at his farm and the amount he wrote and everything like that, it's close to not physically possible that he could have done without a little bit of help. Okay, he wrote a crazy amount of, of information on Kola Tarkula, and it's, I mean, it's wild. So some people say that itself is a proof that he had a Magid that was helping him out, you know. He had obviously someone that was pushing his pen or something like that. Just to know all the information is one thing, but to write it all, it was, ugh, the Beit Yosef. I'm shocked, the Beit Yosef took him a little bit over than 20 years. Took him 20-something years. I don't know if you've ever seen the Beit Yosef. Can I give you a tour of the Beit Yosef here in the back? You want to see how much writing? They're just writing. And it's not writing Harry Potter, right? I'm trying to say, right? Over that, that you can write in five minutes the garbage, right? That's not such a big deal to do. You just make it up on the way, and that's it. This is absolute, every word is Torah, written ball pad of every Risha and every Gemara. Everything is, you know, the tour says something, and he says it's over here, and it's over there, and all these Marm Kona. It's, it's, it's wild that that could have been written in 20-some years. So the Pashtut is he had a Magid that was by his side to a certain extent. You know, I was helping him, helping him on, helping him speed up the pace, or whatever it was. Yeah, you want to do that? Okay, one second. Yeah, go ahead. It's said that we all have an whether. Uh, yeah, well, where, not like this, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. How have I? I mean, I wish. Whether, but, uh, whether we are aware of that, that person being next to us. Mm-hmm. My father, Al Bashalom, yeah. knew that his buggy was some Indian chief. Uh, and he, was some what? Was an Indian chief. Oh, what? Uh, Interesting, okay. How do you know that? <laughs> just, just, How do you know that? That's interesting. He was Jewish? Someone Jewish? Wow, okay. So this we have to speak about after the year. I don't know. <laughs> Here, we'll see. What does it That's mean to know. the Torah? So he used to, I don't know if he helped him explain or he, he sped up his pen. I'm serious, or something like that. Does that make sense? Together, it was like a charuta almost, but a guy who knew a lot. Oh, it was within his body. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that I don't know. Could be. If you go to Tzfat, by the way, they know where the Beit Yosef wrote his Beit Yosef and where he is. So they know the place where he was staying out with the with the Magid. It used to be open. Now it's locked. It only they open only open in certain times. In the way, by the way, in Tzfat, you can find the time where it, it's underneath the shul where they call the Beit Yosef shul. It's underneath. You have to go around. There's two or three people that actually live there. And it's a little machsan, because you can see through the window, but to get it, it's usually locked with a chain. You have to get permission from it. The people who live there, they can get you the key, just so you know. You go to the Shul of Beit Yosef and ask them, they'll tell you, it's right underneath there. I, I, I've seen it before, I was in there before. But, uh, Do you see the I don't think you see the Magid. No, I didn't, you probably will, I didn't see it. <laughs> Anyway, so the Magid, so this is incredible sefer, but it's a hard sefer to read after a minute, an Aramaic. There's a sefer called Magid Misharm, which are a full book on the Parshiot of all the things the Magid used to tell Maran, the Beit Yosef. A lot of things that he used to tell him on different Parshiot, incredible things. It's not black and white, it's not, I don't think, they haven't translated into English yet, so I don't know what to tell you. The art school Magid Misharm, maybe they'll come out with it soon. But at this stage it's in Aramaic and it's not so easy to read. 
But al Kopanim over there, he has a number of things that he told him. And one of the things that he told him, he said, you should know up in Shemayim, the Magi told the Beit Yosef, that the Rif, the Rosh, and the Rambam are all waiting to greet you, to welcome you upstairs. Because you always paskin, and you always came to be Metarsim. Your whole Sefer is always coming to explain them, understand them in your old deep, and you also always went with the halacha like them, and they're all standing by the doorstep waiting to introduce you. A nice entourage over there. No, not bad. I wouldn't mind coming to his, uh, his levaya. Okay? But Uncle Padim, that's, a, that's a the same idea that when a person said. It was some type of malach. Yeah. Now he's saying it was something in his body. I thought it was something out of his body. I can't tell you exactly, but it was some type of... Yeah. Look, in the Gemara, people had Eliyahu Navi. Yeah? People had Gilu Eliyahu. They, they speak to Eliyahu. It wasn't Eliyahu Navi, but it was some type of... Magi, there was a malach that used to give him a... I didn't hear about that. That's true. He had a magi also. There are big people that had magi. I didn't have to hear about uh, Ben Ishchai. I wouldn't be surprised. Though. They say the Ramchal. The Ramchal, they said, yeah. The Ramchal for sure, yeah. Especially... That's another proof. He wrote... He, he wrote a lot. Crazy about his farm. 60, 70 his farm. And he was nipped for 38 years old. So, I don't know. They said Oh, well... That's not good, you're saying. And, and then what? That was his mother. Oh, I see. Okay. Very good. I, I, don't, I don't think he comes downstairs, from what I understand, but I'm, I'm a little bit surprised, but okay. Um, all right. The Shach. The Shach writes in one place. The Shach writes in one place. In Sivan Sadi Aleph, after he finished uh, proving something, he said, I'm positive that this mandamer in the Mishnah is going to come to escort me into Shemaim because I know that I answered him and I'm the one who gave him credentials here and therefore he's going to come and take me up to Shemaim. Okay, that's, uh, that's that. Those are the Peleoets. The Peleoets, the Peleoets, he brings down the Maram al Sheikh is the name of a Sefer. And there was a certain person who used to answer him many times, he used to answer him his questions a lot. He said one time there was a pogrom. There was a pogrom, you know, they were trying to do a thing and there was a person who was miraculously saved and the Peleo, it says, I know the reason why he was saved is because the Maram al Sheikh came down from Shemaim and he saved this guy. He pulled him out of the pogrom, he pulled him out, and he miraculously saved this person because this person used to always answer up or help the questions on the... Defend. Defend him. He would always defend him. Good. So therefore, he actually saved him pogrom. There's a safer called... These are all just proofs of this idea, but it's very interesting ideas, and you see it just overlapping everywhere. There's a safer called Magine Shlomo. I don't know if everyone knows who that is. Magine Shlomo, it was the grandfather of the Pnei Yehoshua. The Pnei Yehoshua is a person who has a peerage on the Gemara, famous Pnei Yehoshua. Magine Shlomo lived in the late 1600s. Why do you call... What's the name Magine Shlomo? It means protecting Shlomo. Who's Shlomo? His name, there's a, a big person, maybe you've heard of him, his name was Rav Shlomo Yitzchaki. Does anyone know who Rav Shlomo Yitzchaki is? Rashi, Rashi. Okay, Rashi is Rosh Hashanah Yitzchaki. Now, Rashi had a lot of people that tried to uh, uh, pound him, okay? That tried to ask questions on him, especially, especially Tosva, who coincidentally were, many of them were his grandchildren, okay? But there, yeah, and a lot of people that, the whole Sefer Magine Shlomo is there to answer every question that anyone asked on Rashi. The whole Sefer is Miyuad, is specialized just, it was written 350 years ago, 400 years ago even, 350 years ago, just to answer all the questions on Rashi. Okay, to explain every Rashi and everything to do. Okay, that's the Sefer Magine Shlomo. You look in the introduction to the Sefer, if you look and you open the introduction to the Sefer, he writes like this. He says that uh, Rashi came to him in a, Rashi came to him in a dream at the, towards the end of his days, and Rashi came in a simcha gdola. Rashi himself came to him with a big simcha. And Rashi said to him, Roshlom Yitzchaki said to him, Ashrecha be'oilam azeh v'tov l'cha be'olam haba. You're, having, you're going to be in good shape upstairs and downstairs. Why? Bishvil shata matzil uti min arayot. You protect me from the lions that are always, that are coming to go connecting with harifim ba'alei atosvat, etc. And he says, and I promise you, Rashi said, I promise you, I'm going to come down and escort you into Shemaim when it's time for you to go upstairs. With all my Talmidim. Rashi is going to come with all his Talmidim. Now I have to be honest with you, whenever I think of Rashi, I think of one person who has Talmidim is Rashi. There's nobody else in the world that is more Talmidim than Rashi. Maybe Moshe Rabbeinu. But everybody learns Rashi. There's no one in the world that doesn't learn Rashi. Rashi is, we are all Talmidim of Rashi. 
So that's a lot of Talmidim to come and escort Megini Shlomo. He had all the Talmidim that came that were learning with him in order to do that. That was pretty good in order to do it. So here we have a reason. Pick a safer, guys, and start answering all the questions on it. Let's go. You can go. You can try to do it. Because that person will try to defend you in its best uh, case. It's very interesting, no? It's a very interesting thing, another phenomenon. However, I have to say the opposite side of the fence for one second. If I could just write the opposite side of the fence. With this, I'm finishing basically. I'm coming to a close. We started late a little bit, so I just went over a bit a little bit. I'm sorry. In the Sefer Chasidim, he brings that a tzaddik brings up another tzaddik into Shemaim. He says, however, if a person comes to go against a Sefer, shalol l'shem Shemaim. If a person does a l'shem Shemaim, then we find all the time, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the Chatam Sofer, they write, that's a good thing and you're supposed to, and it's not, not a problem to disagree with the Sefer. Rabbi Moshe Feinstein said, I've never ever been insulted by someone trying to come against me. I'm very happy. Someone apologized in a, in a letter one time. He said, I apologize maybe because I disagreed with you. And not nice way. He said, I've never been insulted. Never doesn't hurt me. It doesn't bother me. But, uh, but, uh, it's argue, but if a person argues Shalol Hashem Shemaim, and a lot of, unfortunately, sometimes people do it just to get Kavod. They want to get their own Kavod. They want people to give them Kavod, etc. So says the, uh, the Sefer HaChasidim, which is Rav Yudah Chassid, which is 800 years ago. He says that person will come down and he's going to give it to you over the head. Right? He basically says that he's going to be Soita Dvarav and he's going to say, why did you do that in order to do that? It's inappropriate what you did. And uh, he's, gonna, it's going to be a big kitrug for the person. It's, that person himself is going to come down and give a kitrug against, uh, uh, against that person. Okay? That's another facet. So we spoke out today the five different types of neshamot. We spoke about the idea of the tzelem. We spoke about that before mita, a person sees a number of things. First of all, his krovei mishpacha, his family. And B, the different rabbanim, which he came to answer. Sometimes his own rav, his own rav might come to greet him, who was already in Iftar, obviously. Who, uh, who was coming to, uh, to, uh, to greet him at the time. Uh, at the time. There's one last thing, which we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for next time, which is of course going to be the Gilu Shechina. A person sees to a certain extent a very strong light, which is the Shechina, to a certain extent, that a person is able to feel it, and then that is the way that he can uh, get a certain experience in order to want to connect to that light. He is a yearning, a yearning to get to that light, and that is the way eventually the Neshama leaves the goof. Because the Neshama sees this light and slowly but surely is dying, dying, right? To get, <laughs> well, dying is a good word here, right? He's dying to get to that force, that light that's there, and then eventually the body separates from the Neshama. And this is with the Tzadikim. With the Mashaim, it's a little bit different. It's not exactly like that. That we'll speak out next time. And believe it or next time we'll already start saying a few stories of near-death experiences, and we'll try to make a compare and contrast to see how much overlap, incredible overlap there is between all these phenomena that we're saying and what people have to say for themselves. That'll be next week. The week after that, maybe we'll show a couple videos. As Hashem, we'll get a hold of a couple videos, and we'll try to uh, show them for 10, 15 minutes. I'm not going to take the whole share, right? I was like when people have these matzegets, they have these videos, that's the best way to give a share. You just put it on and you sit on the side and you go ahead. <laughs> so, right. so we'll do it for like 10, 15 minutes just to be able to show a little bit of that. Okay, okay. One thing before you go. Rabbi, yeah. if the neshama leaves the body, does it carry the message?